Boy, it, it is, it's been a year, but it's good to be back with you. Grateful for the opportunity that Pastor uh, Matthew gave as he invited me to come. And I, I know that this time of the year is special for us here in Colorado, not just for the churches in Colorado, but also for um, this church because of your connection with our state mission offering, which is in honor of Nicey Murphy. Nicey Murphy was a longtime member of your church here, and um, uh, she was a, a missions pioneer, not only in missions education, but also in her, her own missions activity. And given that she, was, that she did that, the state named the offering that takes place in September after her and continues to carry on that very same support. Am I on? Okay, I'm good. I feel like I'm shouting. Sorry. I'm not angry. I'm excited. All right. And so as she's done that, that mission offering that we have continues in that same spirit of touching people in Colorado, helping the work here, just like the video that you saw that connects so many people in this desire for all of our churches to connect and see the gospel advanced, but to do it in partnership together. We, we partner together so that we can be a part of gospel impact. That's one of the great things about Southern Baptists for years is we understand the value that we can do more connected together than we can by ourselves. And so we do it in partnership, we do it uh, uh, as churches individually. I'd invite you to take your Bibles this morning and turn with me to Joshua chapter 3. And in a moment, we're going to look at Joshua chapter 3, verse 7 to 4, 7. But I want to kind of set the stage by talking about this, and I think it carries through this theme of what Nicey Murphy left us as a legacy of mission involvement, of mission education, of mission commitment. Because in all of the things that Nicey Murphy did, she was able to tell the story. She had her own story to tell of what she saw God do in her life and through her surrender. And I think that's so very, very important. We partner together so we can have greater kingdom impact. But the reality of life is that what God desires for us to do is to draw close to Him individually. We, we see the fruits of our labor when we come together. We see the fruits of connection in strategy or the wisdom of, of partnering together. But the reality is that it starts, that effective kingdom ministry starts at a very foundational level, at a very personal level. That is, when one person commits to surrender themselves to the Lord and gets to be a part of that story that he's carrying on. That we not only get to share what God's done in our lives, but impacts those that are around us that we have the opportunity to touch. And so I'm convinced that there's nothing that fires us more up for missions than doing missions. Amen? Something about getting your hands dirty, having your own story to tell. There's nothing that fires you up for ministry more than doing ministry. We can tell the stories of how others have ministered to people, but it's when we exercise that in our lives that we get to recount, this is what I saw God do in amazing ways. And in that we have our own story to tell. And that's what our passage of Scripture really is all about this morning, is about the impact of having our own story to tell. And so I want us to look at the text this morning at Joshua chapter Three, and we're going to start in verse 7, and then I'm going to read through chapter 4, verse 7. And, and if your translation's a little different than mine, I'm reading from the New American Standard this morning. Joshua chapter 3, starting in verse 7. Now the Lord said to Joshua, This day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that just as I have been with Moses... I will be with you. You shall moreover command the priests who are carrying the Ark of the Covenant, saying, When you come to the edge of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. 
Then Joshua said to the sons of Israel, Come here and hear the words of the Lord your God. Joshua said, By this you shall know that the living God is among you, and he will assuredly dispossess from before you the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Hivite, the Perizzite, the Girgashite, the Amorite, and the Jebusite. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is crossing over ahead of you into the Jordan. Now then, take for yourselves twelve men from the tribes of Israel, one man for each tribe. It shall come about when the soles of the feet of the priests who carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, rest in the waters of the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan will be cut off, and the waters which are flowing down from above will stand in one heap. So when the people set out from their tents to cross the Jordan with the priests carrying the ark of the covenant before the people, and when those who carried the ark came into the Jordan, and the feet of the priests carrying the ark were dipped in the edge of the water, for the Jordan overflows all its banks all the days of the harvest. The waters which were flowing down from above stood and rose up in one heap, a great distance away at Adam, the city which is beside Zarethan. And those which were flowing down toward the sea of the Arabah, the salt sea, were completely cut off, so the people crossed opposite Jericho. And the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan, while all Israel crossed on dry ground until all the nation had finished crossing the Jordan. Now when all the nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord spoke to Joshua, saying, Take for yourselves twelve men from the people, one man from each tribe, and command them, saying, Take up for yourselves twelve stones from here out of the middle of the Jordan, from the place where the priest's feet are standing firm, and carry them over with you, and lay them down in the lodging place where you will lodge tonight. So Joshua called the twelve men whom he had appointed from the sons of Israel, one from each tribe, and Joshua said to them, Cross again to the ark of the Lord your God into the middle of the Jordan, and each of you take up a stone on his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Israel. Let this be a sign among you, so that when your children ask you later, What do these stones mean to you? Then you shall say to them, because the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, when it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall become a memorial to the sons of Israel forever. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the opportunity for us to come and to worship as we have and to, and to join together, and to encourage one another, and to, to lift one another up. But Father, we're here to submit and to surrender ourselves to You, to Your purpose, to Your will, that we might be people who have a story to tell, that we might be people who engage in the work that You've called us to, that we might be Your faithful ambassadors out in the world. Not a group of people, Father, that are smarter than others, or better than others, or, or even... Father, that know more than others, but people who have said yes to you and trust you with the results. We ask you to bless us this morning as we continue to look at your word, that we might take away a a piece, Father, of, of what you desire us to know, that we will be strengthened and encouraged in our walk with you to draw closer to you so that we might see you move. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning as we we look at this text, we're going to look at two separate things. I want us to look at this text and I want us to look at the examples of surrender that we see illustrated in this text, that we might understand the importance of surrender and what happens when we do that. But the second piece that I want us to look at is the impact that it has not only on God's people, when we surrender and see Him move, but the impact that it has on those who are around us that get to witness what the Lord does in our lives. So let's look at the first example this morning. It is the the example of surrender. And there are three examples of surrender that we see in this text. And if you have your outline handy, there's some blanks for you to fill in. 
so you don't fall asleep on me. <laughs> all right, all right. I was a pastor for a long time. I understand how this works. So the, let's look at the first point. The first example of surrender that we see here this morning is the commitment of Joshua. The commitment of Joshua. For those who, who have followed a, an impactful or well-loved leader in their lives, they can, they've known the stinging words, well, brother so-and-so didn't do it like that. Or sister so-and-so didn't do it that way. We understand what that's like. Can you imagine what it would have been like to have followed a leader like Moses? The Scripture tells us that Moses met with God face to face as a man meets with his friend. How, how would you have liked to have followed Moses as a leader? However, it's in the opening verse that we looked at this morning in Joshua chapter 3, verse 7, where the Lord speaks to Joshua and tells him, you are now the man. And he says these words, This day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that just as I have been with Moses, I will be with you. So let's think about the example of Moses' life for a moment. Those of you that are familiar with, with the Old Testament accounts of Moses' life know this. It wasn't an easy road, was it? If Moses' life was an example of what leadership for Israel is going to be, it certainly demonstrated that it was not going to be without challenges. There were times as Moses was leading the children of Israel in the desert that they heard over and over this refrain, Why have you brought us out here to die? <laughs> were there not graves in Egypt? But regardless of what they heard, or what Moses heard as he was leading God's people, he remained faithful to do as God instructed him to do. The Lord spoke to Moses, and Moses spoke to the people. They didn't always embrace what he had to say, but he was faithful to do that. And so Moses' faithfulness brought the people to the doorstep of the promised land. Joshua would learn in subsequent years, just as all leaders understand, that the commissioning to leadership is very different than the implementation of leadership. Everybody celebrates when you've been named the new leader, but then make a decision that's not popular and all of a sudden that begins to crumble. Yet in, in, Mos, or in Joshua's leadership, the role that the Lord had assigned him was just like he had assigned Moses. I'm going to share with you, and you share with my people. And so the Lord smoke, spoke his commands, and Joshua communicated to the people. Even though Joshua had no idea how they were going to respond to these, uh, to these instructions, he was faithful to do as God instructed him. And so it is... The first example we see is in Josh, the surrender is that Joshua demonstrated his commitment to the Lord. Let's look at the second example. And the second example is the response of the people. This is our second example of surrender. I want you to, to think with me for a moment about who these Hebrews were. They've been wandering in the desert for some time now, and they're at the edge of the promised land. All they had known for 40 years was a, a nomadic lifestyle. These were not soldiers. This was not a war party. The conquest of the promised land had not yet started, and yet every person who was camped at the edge of the Jordan River understood that the reason they were there was because of the conquest that was about to begin. They knew from the spies almost 40 years ago that the land they were entering into was a land flowing with milk and honey. They also understood from the spies that were some 40 years ago that there are giants in the land. Understand, none of those dynamics have changed. The land is still promising. The land is what God has given them, flowing with milk and honey, but the people that are in there defending it are big. And so... Joshua, uh, the Lord speaks to Joshua in Joshua 3.10. And Joshua said, By this you shall know that the, that the living God is among you, that he is assuredly dispossessed before you, the Canaanite, 
the Hittite, the Hivite, the Jebusite, the Girgashite, the Amorite, and the Jebusite. That the Lord was going behind them, before them and was going to remove or was going to dispossess the land from before those people. What they needed to understand is that this Jordan crossing was not just going to be a way for them to get from one side to the other. It was going to be a demonstration of God's power. And so here they are at the standing at the edge, a people who, who were not warriors, but preparing for battle. And this demonstrates something for us. Again, not, a, not just a way to cross over, but a demonstration of God's power in this moment and time. Because what the Lord wanted them to understand is though it may be scary and there may be anxiety going across because you've never been there before, the victory was already won. The fact that God did a miracle in this moment in time was His demonstration. I can handle the waters. I can handle the big people. Just stay with me. And so, while they did not know what was before them, the text tells us that the people surrendered to the Lord, to the Lord's Word through Joshua, and they moved to the very edge of the Jordan River to wait and see what was going to happen next. And so in this, the people surrendered and led to their obedience to the Lord. There's one final example I want us to look at of surrender in the text, and that is the faith of the priests. Now again, I want you to, to think with me about who these priests were. They were instructed to carry the, um, the Ark of the Covenant into the Jordan River. And the text tells us that the Jordan River was at flood stage. So it was at flood stage during all the days of harvest, which meant that the waters ran deeper and faster and wider than at any other time of the year. We might even say that this is God showing off. He could have taken them across the river when it was at normal stage, but no, he waited until it was flood stage, until it was impassable for them to get across. And so the instruction of the Lord to the priests was this. Take the ark and take it to the edge of the water and step into the water and then the miracle was going to take place. Now, I, I know me. I would have preferred to have stood on the edge of the water holding the ark and, okay, Lord, as soon as the waters recede, I'll step in. But that wasn't what he asked him to do, was it? He said, no, I need you in the water as an act of faith, and then I'll show you what I can do. I want you to think about who these priests were as well. So we've talked about Joshua. We've kind of unpacked a little bit of who the people were. But I want you to think about the priests. In Numbers chapter 32, the text, the scriptures tell us that because of their disobedience back 40 years ago, the Lord said that no one, no man, 20 years or older, was going to see the promised land. So that means all those men that were 20 years or older died off in the wilderness. Now we have essentially a new generation. And the priests would have been in the same situation as well. And the reason I bring that up is because most likely those that went through the Red Sea that were still alive were children because all of the adults had, had died away. That means these priests who are standing at the edge of the Red Sea or the edge of the Jordan River about to step in had no similar experience in which to draw from. Had they been through the Red Sea, had they been adults in the Red Sea, and they remember the dynamic event that took place, they might have said, well, God did it at the Red Sea. We saw Him do that. He can do it here. But most likely, this is a completely different generation of people who didn't have that, which heightens and elevates the act of faith on their part. We've not seen the Lord do this before, but if He tells us to do this, we have to exercise faith. And so they stepped into the water, and the, and the waters receded. The surrender of the priests helped them to step in faith, instructed them. 
Three examples of surrender which led to this moment in time when God acted. Now I want us to think about the second lesson. So the first one is about surrender. The second lesson is about the impact of God's movement upon the people who were there that day, who were eyewitnesses of what happened. In Joshua chapter 3, verses 17, it says, And the priests who carried the Ark of the Covenant stood firm on dry ground in the middle of the Jordan, and all Israel crossed on dry ground until the nation had finished crossing. Because they had a shared surrender, they all had a shared experience. Think about this. Every single person in the camp on that day, Joshua, the leaders, the priests, the people, the children, the animals, everyone there had a a front row seat to something that God did because they had surrendered to what He had instructed them. In Joshua chapter 4, verses 1 through 7, it reveals to us the Lord's instructions. And, And there are some of you, maybe many of you, that are familiar with this. That they were to go down, they were to take a stone, one representing each tribe of Israel, 12 stones, and they were to carry them and build a monument. Now the beauty of a monument is that a monument is a a mile marker, a signpost, something in our lives that we say, God did this at this moment in time, and it's to build faith moving forward. If the Lord, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, could do this, then what I'm facing now, He can do that. And the text tells us that it was to be a monument for all generations to see that in that moment in time, this is what the Lord did. But I want you to look with me at verse 6. Because verse 6 says this, Let this be a sign among you, so that when your children ask later, and here's the question, what do these stones mean to you? That's a personal question, isn't it? What do these mean to you, the eyewitnesses who were there on that day? Folks, the beauty of a, of a, personal story and having your own story to tell is the fact that people can debate with you on your theological position they can say i don't believe that i don't believe that necessarily but when you're sharing experience that happened to you let somebody deny that that happened there's power in a personal story and here these people all had a personal story they were told Later, that was in Joshua 4.24, it says that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty so that they may fear the Lord God forever. But it was for that generation to tell the story. They had seen it. I want you to think about what that was like for successive generations. Kids could have gone to Gilgal generations later and seen this monument because that's where it was established. And they could have seen, oh, the Lord God did this at this time. But it may not have had the same impact on those generations later to see a monument as it did on that, that one generation, that personal that had it, saw it themselves. It may even be like kids that go to a museum today, right? They're on a field trip for school. They get to see these things that are thousands of years old. They're relics. I, I can only speak from what I imagine my grandkids who are here might experience yeah great when's lunch that's old great there's no context in that when you know what what's for what's to eat but the idea here is that that it's impactful for that first generation let me see if i can illustrate this when uh when we sally and i were going to the national convention this year the southern baptist convention in indianapolis we arrived early and we were kind of waiting in the main uh, concourse where the two concourses come together. We were meeting in the area of the food court, waiting on the rest of our party to show up. And as we were sitting there waiting, we realized that there were people who were dressed in uniform that had gathered. And they, and they began to gather over time, probably over the next hour. There were VFW people, there were, they were um uniformed policemen they were active duty military they were there there were people that were there just holding flags before long there was probably 200 or so folks 
that were there. And then, then there were cameras, like news cameras that were there. And we began to ask questions what was going on. Well, we were there on Saturday, June 8th. On Thursday, June 6th, was the 80th anniversary of the invasion of Normandy. And apparently there were three Normandy veterans that had gone over to Normandy to celebrate the 80th anniversary and they were returning home on that day. There was a great parade and party of people that were celebrating their coming. Folks, you and I could go to Normandy and just be in awe of what that historic moment, that historic place meant. But it wouldn't have been the same as those three men who actually fought at Normandy, who landed on those beaches, who saw their friends killed. It's impactful to be an eyewitness. I had the privilege for serving 18 years as a senior pastor in three different churches. While I was there, we promoted missions. Lottie Moon, Annie Armstrong, and our state mission offering. I pastored in Aurora for seven years, and so we got to celebrate Nicey Murphy. By the way, I got a chance to meet her when I was a youth pastor in Lafayette. Great lady. So we promoted missions at all of those churches that we were at. We promoted the cooperative program giving. But when it came to going on mission trip, that was something that our associate pastor, our youth pastor, went on. And, and I spent a great deal of time living off of the stories that they would bring back and share. In 2009, all of that changed. I was pastoring in Southern California, and we had a missionary who was back on furlough that came and connected uh, with our church, wanted to come back and share what God had done. They were serving in India, and so he came, and we had the opportunity to, to host them on a Sunday night, and, and it was just amazing what they shared. And I, I got to know him. They were home for eight months. We got to know him more and more and, and began a relationship. They were a part of one of the big churches that was in our area, and they just felt disconnected, and so the, eventually they joined our church. And, the, and my heart just went out to the work that they were doing. And so I asked Bill, Bill and Grace Egan were their names, I asked them, what is it that we can help you do? They were serving in India, uh, southern part of India. It was a persecuted area. Can't just take a group of people to do VBS. Can't take a group of people just to do uh, a building project. I wanted to know what can we do to connect in an effective way with what your strategy is. And so it was to go over and to help train village pastors. Many, many village pastors, very, very poor people living on about $50 U.S. every month, but love the Lord. But there was no formal theological education for them. And so I, I, I'm one of those weird people. I like writing curriculum. So we put together some very simple, basic, entry-level, uh, systematic theology and we went over and did training the training was great watching them those aha moments were great but hearing their stories is what I brought home because these were men who were persecuted many of them had similar stories of the elders of the village came and one man had his house burned another man saw his wife beaten before him now, you know what, folks? You, you can do a lot of things to me, but you mess with my wife, and all of a sudden we're having another conversation. That's, that's my flesh. That's what my heart says. And two men that were there at that initial training had only been released from the hospital because they themselves were beaten, and they were there. And we worshiped. We, we sang, we began with worship every time that we got together, and I didn't understand a word they were saying, but I could see the joy in their hearts. And my spirit identified with their spirit and what they were doing. And here's what, I, here's what I took away. All the hardship that they encountered, all that they endured, what I remember most about that time was there was no bitterness in their hearts. There was no bitterness in the words. There was only joy for being able to serve the Lord as they were called to do. And I believe it was in that moment that God broke my heart for missions that moved me into even the position that I serve now where I get to work with the whole state 
and, and see missions expanded and grow. But it was because now I had a story to tell. There is a radical difference between telling somebody else's story and telling your own story and seeing what God did. I want to close this morning with an illustration that starts in Joshua chapter 24. So if you'll turn with me to Joshua 24, our text was just before the crossing of the Jordan River, before the conquest of the land, the promised land started. Joshua 24 is the account of after the conquest is over. The fighting is done. Joshua's gathered the people together for the last time. This is the last words that he's going to speak to this group that he's led now through this conquest. And, it's, and these are words that, that many of you, again, may be very familiar with. Kind of Joshua 24, starting in verse 14. And this is what Joshua says to the people at Shechem that are gathered before they go off to their inheritance to take their, their share of the, of the land. And he says this in verse 14. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve Him in sincerity and truth and put away the gods which your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. If it is disagreeable in your sight to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves today whom you will serve whether the gods which your fathers served, which were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. The illustration I want to I share with you is, is from that passage, and we're going to look at Judges chapter 2 so you can turn there. But there are three chairs that I've put up here. And they were never intended for people to come up and sit in if you fell asleep during my message. They're just illustrations, just placeholders. But we're going to call these our generations. Each of these chairs is a different generation. We're going to call... We're going to call this... I'm trying, I see things backwards. I want to do this from your perspective. We're going to call this the first generation. We're going to call this the Joshua generation. And this will be the second generation. We'll call it the generation of the elders. And this is the third generation. It's the generation that followed the elders or their children. So if you can think in your mind, though it's not literally this in, in the text, but if you think in your mind, these are the grandparents, the parents, and their children. I want you to look at what the text says about the Joshua generation in Judges chapter 2, verses 6 and the first part of verse 7. It says, when Joshua had dismissed the people, again, they were at Shechem, and he's dismissing them to go from what we read out of Joshua 24. The sons of Israel went each to his inheritance to possess the land. The people served the Lord all the days of Joshua. So the Joshua generation is, is known by the verb served. They were actively involved. They were people who were sold out. These are people who were committed to the work that the Lord had called them to. Not just committed corporately, but committed personally. These are the people who sacrifice to see that, that the work carries on, not only in the place where they're at, but in other places as well. This generation served the Lord. That's important. Now I want you to pick up with me and let's look again at verse 7, the beginning of verse 7. It says, The people served the Lord all the days of Joshua, then look what it says. And all the days of the elders who survived Joshua, who had seen all the great work which the Lord had done for Israel. Do you notice a shift in verb? These people served the Lord, and these people saw what the Lord did. These people were committed. This is the group of people that went to church every Sunday. Not because they had to, not because someone was dragging them to, but because this is where community was. This is where they drew strength from. This is where they drew fellowship. This is where they got their, their charge for the week. This is where they were encouraged by the work that they were called to do. That God wanted the church to engage in. They were there. These are their children, the generation of the elders. This is the group of people who they themselves would have been believers, but the greatest story they had to tell... It's how they came to know the Lord Jesus Christ. 
They saw the great work that the Lord did, but because they were passengers along with what they, they witnessed their parents doing. And because of faithfulness here, God moved, and because of that, they saw. You see the difference? These are committed, and these, they have a story to tell, but it may be 10 or 20 or 30 or 40 years ago. It's not contemporary. In fact, this is a group of people that may have all the right things to say, might know all the answers, but their lives are different at home than they are when they're with a group of people that, that know the Lord. These are individuals that saw I want you to look at the impact of this decline in commitment. I want you to look with me at verse 10, and we'll look now at the third generation, the third chair. It says, all that generation were also gathered, not speaking about the elders, they were gathered to their fathers, and there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord, nor yet the work which he had done for Israel. You see the, see the impact of what happens? This pe these people were sold out and their children had a relationship with the Lord though they struggled with fellowship from time to time and surrender and obedience. But because of inconsistency in this chair, when their children went to school and when they were challenged with whether or not the Lord is real, whether or not the Bible is reliable, they look at their parents and they say, well, we don't see the same commitment. We don't even know if mom and dad believe what they're saying. And it leads to, I don't believe either. The challenge for us as God's children is to stay in this chair. The battle for us as God's children is that we will always tend to slide to this chair. I remember times as a pastor of the church where my wife and I would have, I don't want to say an argument, because pastors and their wives have animated discussions. <laughs> but my kids are sitting in the back seat listening to that. And then guess what happens when we get out of the car? I see a deacon or a Sunday school teacher and say, isn't the Lord good today? after just coming from a fight with my wife. And this is the example that now I leave to my kids. I need to be in this chair. I need to fight against this chair. You know how you get into this chair? Do nothing. Just, just coast. And you slide right here. And it's so, it's so subtle, you don't even realize it's happening until all of a sudden you ask the question, how did I get here? This is the battle. This is the text that we're looking at this morning and the, re the reliability of having a personal story to tell. If we stay surrendered and connected to the Lord, partnership is great, but this is what God calls us to do. This is foundational. I can't rely on someone else's story. I have to be surrendered so that God's building that story in my life so that I can say, this is what I saw the Lord do. This is what he can do. This is what he can do in your life because I see it in mine. This is the power of the story. This is the power of having a story to tell. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning thanking you for the truth of your word and thanking you, Lord, that you are faithful in all things. The Lord, that I know that I am faulty and I fail all the time but God you don't ask me to be perfect what you ask me to do is to continue to come back to you to continue to surrender my life when I my life gets out of balance to come back and say Lord I'm yours do with me as you wish and father as we see that happen in our lives all of a sudden we are aware of the movement and the work of the spirit and we get to see what happens and we get to share that with others with passion and, and excitement. Not just as a matter of fact, but as a life-changing event. Father, move all of us as your people. 
Help us not to live in that second chair, but to remain, to fight for that first chair so that, Lord, we may be the ambassadors you've called us to be in a world that desperately needs to see something real. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.